I'd like to um, talk to you this morning, uh, not just about preparing for growth. I was asked to, to talk about growing Red X in a challenging environment, but as I was thinking about what to say, I started to think more about what is uh, affecting, afflicting our industry right now in terms of the, the, the changing R&D environment in large pharma and how that is impacting uh, companies such as RedX and, and other uh, biotechs and indeed through to academia. And thinking about how we place that in an economic context. Uh, how the industry up until now has been driven by certain economic factors and survival of the fittest and how going forwards we may need to, to uh, review that approach. And so I started thinking about Keynes and Hayek, who of course will be familiar to all of you, I'm sure. You'll all be experts on macroeconomic theory. Um, and wanted to, to uh, pose the problem, if you like, in, in the context of, of their philosophies. Before that, though, uh, the commercial. Redex Pharma uh, was established in September 2010. Uh, we are a small molecule uh, discovery and development company developing our own therapeutics, focused, as Nathan said, in oncology and infectious disease. Uh, we currently employ about 110 staff, although uh, that was last week's number, uh, and it's rising all the time. By the end of this year, that'll be about 200. Uh, based in facilities both in Liverpool and most recently, we've taken space on AstraZeneca's site at Alderley Park in Cheshire, uh, where we've launched our anti-infectives business. Um, to date, we've raised about $35 million. Roughly half of that has come from high net worth investors. Uh, and I use the term investors. They are not angels. These are people that are putting money in uh, for equity as a standard investment with a view to, to generating a, a return in exactly the same way uh, as a fund would. And for them, grant funding uh, is very important because it's non-dilutive finance for them. Uh, so we've also been successful, as, as Nathan alluded to, uh, in raising, now it's just over, uh, it's just approaching 13 million pounds in grant funding to support uh, the work that we do within RedX. And what that is allowing us to do is create uh, a talent pool, if you like, taking advantage of, of some of the changes in the industry and the people that are available to us, that uh, is allowing us to develop therapeutics to a point where we provide them on as a pipeline to, to large pharma. So Keynes and Hayek, uh, for those of you that have forgotten your macroeconomic theory, um, Keynes was the father of, of fiscal stimulus, as he has often talked about, very much focused on uh, interventionist policies, um, believed that markets should be steered rather than allowed simply to uh, develop their own way. Hayek uh, portrayed as his arch enemy. Uh, who was all about the free market and, and allowing the market to find its own level and survival of the fittest. Um, in fact, uh, there was a huge amount of respect between these two gentlemen. Uh, Hayek, when Keynes uh, died, Hayek described him as the only great man that he had ever met. Um, something is often made of, of the fact that only one of them won a Nobel Prize, uh, but the main reason for that is that Keynes died about 20 years before the Nobel Prize for Economics was actually founded. Uh, so uh, hence the reason that he wasn't really in the running. So the challenge that we have, and as all good management books will tell you, uh, a challenge is also an opportunity. The challenge that we have in the industry right now is that companies across the board are, rightly or wrongly, uh, downsizing their R&D operations in big pharma. So, you know, you name it, they've done it. AstraZeneca, Merck, Novartis, GSK, Pfizer, they're all slashing the number of scientists that they employ in R&D, and that's having a profound effect. The main driver for that is that they've realized they've got to a point where they're spending, on average, the top 10 pharma companies, on average, spend $8 billion each a year 
on R&D, which is a vast amount of money. And their perception is that they're not getting the returns for that that they should be doing. And if you do the maths, it's very simple. If you go out and do 10 $200 million licensing deals, you'll get 10 things into your pipeline. None of them are getting 10 things into their pipeline every year right now. And it will only cost you $2 billion. It won't cost you $8 billion. So that's where they're seeing the perceived inefficiencies of, of, of the approach that they have right now. And increasingly, what they're saying is that early stage risky stuff, we'll just throw over the fence to biotech and, and to academic institutions. And then we'll cherry pick and bring in assets when they've got to a point that we think there is less risk or if we think they're sexy enough and it's a hot enough target that we want to work on. The consequence of that is that they're burdening an industry, the biotech industry, with a problem that it hasn't really sought and it certainly isn't equipped to deal with. In addition to that, you've got regulatory hurdles that are getting higher and higher all the time and making it more and more difficult to bring products to market. And on the other side of the fence, you've got a patent cliff that is finally here. People have talked about it for years, but it is finally here. So this is uh, US per capita spending growth for both healthcare and medicines uh, from 2002 and projected out to, to 2017. And you'll see that in 2012, uh, there was a shrinkage in healthcare spend. The previous blip in 2007 was, was clearly for uh, economic reasons, but in 2012, the impact is all to do with generics. And this is the share of prescriptions for uh, generic medicines running from 2003 through 2017. If you just compare 2003 with 2012, you'll see that generics have gone, both unbranded and branded together, have gone from 54% of sales in the US to 84%. And that's a huge shift. What is more important, though, is look at the impact of branded generic sales. They've gone down from 11% of sales in 2003 to only 7% in 2012 and are, are predicted to decline still further. So there's a squeeze not on the generics market as a whole, but on the branded generics players as well. They're finding it more and more difficult to, to get their products out there. And the impact of this on large pharma is, is quite dramatic. The other consequence is what we're seeing is that products, uh, prescription costs are becoming lower and lower. So there's a much greater focus on uh, the zero to $10 out of pocket segment uh, than there was back in 2007 and the higher end segments uh, are diminishing. And that's despite the impact of things like very high cost cancer therapies that are coming through. So the problem's been thrown over the fence to biotech and to academia. Um, the big difficulty is that the traditional biotech model is just not equipped to deal with this. There's not enough resource, whether human or financial, to pick up the slack from large pharma R&D. Um, companies in biotech tend to be paradigm driven. They're funded by venture capital, typically, uh, and they tend to be paradigm driven. They have to prove their technology works in order to get a return because they're generally founded on a given technology platform or a given target drug class, sorry. Um, and the difficulty with that is in a situation where they're having to plug that gap and generate all of those early stage programs, if they're focused very narrowly on these paradigms, they're never going to deliver. In academia, the problem is, is one that I guess any academic in the room will, will uh, confirm has always been the case, and it's a lack of funding. Uh, there is just not the money available in academia to take programs to a point where large pharma will be interested in licensing those assets. If you actually look at some of the, the key indices for biotech, and Nathan touched on this earlier on, looking here uh, at data from the uh, National Venture Capital Association in, in the States, 
uh, because it's, it's the most uh, appropriate for the sector. US VC funding to biotech has been flat over the last uh, 12 years or so, both in terms, on average, of the number of deals, but also on the volume of that, the overall volume of that investment. Um, you may say that, well, that's okay, it's flat. The problem is the cost of developing drugs during that time has gone through the roof. So the impact of that on a biotech's ability to plug this gap is substantial. Nathan mentioned startup funding. Startup funding is also drying up. Uh, and it's something that is causing significant difficulties in the sector. You know, it's, it's not just, unfortunately, about your ability to sell to investors. If the investor's not willing to invest in an early stage company, then you're not even going to get in the door. And just to flesh out the, the statistics that Nathan, men Nathan mentioned earlier on, $98 million, down 58% from the previous quarter. The lowest, not for five years or 10 years, but the lowest since the mid 90s. And that's a staggering statistic. The difficulty then is where do biotechs get their funding from? Because there's a huge gap there. On the other end, they've got a problem. How do they get out? If they can get the money, how do they get out? Well, there's two primary routes. One is IPO and the other is sell the business. The difficulty is that the time that pharma is taking to make acquisitions is getting longer and longer and longer. And so from uh, inception of the company to time of a trade sale is now up to about nine years on average, which means that you've got to fund the business for longer. It's not all bad news. Um, the IPO window is opening again. It would appear that uh, the profile is similar to that that was seen between 2003 and 2007, before the, the financial crash. Uh, and this is data from Bio and, and, and speaks specifically to US IPOs, but it's also clear that uh, the IPO window in the UK is opening again, particularly in the AIM market, and there is an appetite for investors mm -hmm. to, to come into biotech companies again. Uh, so, as I say, it's, it's not all bad news. And if you do IPO, hey, it's great, you know. NASDAQ Biotech Index shows that it outperforms Standard & Poor 500 by a country mile. It doesn't really, because <laughs> it's driven by the large biotech companies that have been there from the start. So uh, large and mid-sized companies, if you look, account for 80% of the index by value and 28% by the number of companies. If you actually look at the performance of IPOs since 2009, in general, it's pretty poor. So these are stock values since the companies went to the market. So, okay, 2009 is only an N of two, but if you look at uh, 2011, off 25% on 10 companies, 2012, off 25% uh, on 11 companies. And that statistic is, is probably most pertinent because you're looking at a situation where you had a rising stock market, you had companies coming to the market, and so you would expect them to get that kind of early bounce of, of coming to the market if they've pitched their IPOs properly. And yet, in the early months of them being on the market, they're averaging 25% off. All of that means that it's much more difficult for companies to get investment because VC investors sit there and say, well, the model's broken. We don't think we're going to get our money back. We can't see you getting an exit in terms of a successful IPO where, where we're going to make money on the stock once it floats. And we can't see you selling the company because it's taken too long to get there. So fundamentally, the model in pharma for early stage R&D, I would argue, is broken. So the approach that says a free market, let it all float, let's find out who the fittest are, 
are they going to survive, simply isn't working and isn't going to deliver products going forwards. That has an impact not just on companies, not just on employment, but ultimately on patients and patient care, which at the end of the day is one of the reasons that we're in the industry, is to provide products for patients that are, are going to provide a better experience for them. And what it has resulted in is in areas such as uh, antibacterials and neglected diseases, a huge dearth of new products coming through where they're simply not considered economic enough and uh, companies have not been investing in those specific areas. Now, you know, I don't have time to go into uh, the whys and wherefores of some of those things. We as a company have chosen infectious disease as one of our key areas of focus and antibacterials is a, a, a significant part of that. Um, but all of this points to the fact that there is an opportunity for a new model. And I actually think this is good news, not bad news. I think that the industry as a whole is ripe for change, has to find new ways of doing things. Somebody said to me earlier on, it was Claire said to me earlier on, um, you know, is the industry sustainable? Is pharma sustainable with ever increasing product development costs? and ever-increasing price pressures on products that get to the market, is the pharmaceutical industry as a whole actually sustainable? Arguably, in its current form, no, it's not. There has to be change. So are times changing? Well, we think they are. And, and, and this is what we're looking to do within RedX. So a new R&D model looking to create a resource that generates a sustainable pipeline of assets for large pharma that will plug that yawning translational gap that exists now. What was always talked about as the valley of death has gotten wider and has moved earlier in the process of R&D because of the changes that there have been in the industry. So what we're focused on is driven by science and, and expertise and capacity creating this pipeline of assets from a combination of, of fast follower strategies using our own proprietary uh, platform, as well as, and more importantly, bringing in programs from early stage companies and academia that we can then take on using our resource, both human and financial, take those on and develop them to a point where large pharma is going to be interested in them. The interesting thing about this is that uh, recently we were at, at Bio uh, in the States and we spoke to something like 40 different uh, university tech transfer groups and, and early stage biotechs uh, around in licensing opportunities for RedX. And the very first thing that we did when we walked in was said no upfronts. And we expected that, you know, at most 50% of them would say that's okay, we're, you know, we can deal with that. And the other half would say, no, sorry, we've got, we've got to have an upfront. We've spent money on this program. We've done this, that, and the other. Every single group that we spoke to said, that's fine. We can't do anything with these programs. We don't have the ability to take them forwards. And so they'll just wither on the vine if we don't strike a deal with someone. And that's a, a, a fundamental shift that has happened in the industry. Um, our focus is around medicinal chemistry, uh, in vitro pharmacology, and DMPK, and taking things to a point where they are clinical ready. So we've been lucky. We've been able to benefit from this downsizing in the industry. We've got people in the company that have joined us from Pfizer, AstraZeneca, uh, Lilly, Glaxo, all the majors. So we've been able to bring in this huge bank of experience, supported by a lot of keen young scientists coming out of, of academia, uh, and we've been able to create a, a, a real pool of expertise in the company in oncology and infectious disease that allows us to take these programs forward. And all of them are being challenged to do things differently, not to do it because, oh, well, we always put 50 compounds through that particular study just to see what we got but actually think about what is the most effective and efficient and rapid way to get something through to a stage where it, it's potentially licensable. 
And we spend a lot of time talking to large pharma about this. So they're our ultimate customers. Um, we, uh, from the inception of the company, went out and sat with large pharma and just said, hi, we're here. Uh, we don't have anything to sell yet, but we're here. This is what we're doing. Tell us what you want. Tell us what you need. And we'll try and deliver it to you. And it's amazing when you engage with them on that level, rather than just going in and saying, buy my product. Uh, it's amazing the, the, the different response that you get from pharma. Um, because they will engage. They will work with you. Because ultimately, they know that if you can produce the asset that they need, then, then they've got an opportunity. Um, and so we, we spent a lot of time talking to large pharma uh, at all levels of their organizations, both uh, technical and uh, business as well. And as I said earlier, we're focused on maximizing the use of, of non-dilutive financing. Um, so we use funding from uh, government and charity sources and Ultimately, we will achieve sustainability in our model through partnering revenues. But those partnering revenues aren't necessarily just licensing a program to pharma. We're exploring all sorts of different ways of doing that. So for example, we're in the process of uh, finalizing a deal uh, with a healthcare provider that will be a collaborative R&D deal where we do the work and they pay for it. And then when the program gets licensed on, ultimately, they get a share of the upside. And this is something that hasn't been done before in the UK. Uh, and we, we should be in a, a position to announce that in the next two or three weeks. So that's the business model. And it's all focused on this sustainable early pipeline of, of programs, solving the problem that pharma has created for itself. There is evidence that uh, large pharma mm -hmm. is finally realizing the problem that they've created. So they're looking to more collaborative, early stage uh, uh, agreements with, with outside parties. There's the whole thing about um, open source uh, innovation. And they're also engaging their own pharma venture funds with existing venture capital funds to try and build something and kickstart the whole uh, VC uh, investment. Deal structures are changing. So you're getting a lot more in the way of collaborative arrangements. Uh, I was talking to somebody from Daiichi last week who was saying that, for example, they've just established a completely new group within their business development uh, arena where they are focused exclusively on licensing in uh, very, very early stage programs and technologies on an option basis where they'll take it, they'll pay for a year or two years with an option to take what comes out of that and, and do subsequent deals. And that's all that that group is, is going to be focused on. Uh, so deal structures are, are changing quite uh, dramatically in, in the industry. Um, you've got, you know, we, we spoke to another couple of companies, large pharma companies at, at Bio who uh, are looking for partner biotech companies to do their early stage R&D. Not a CRO model, but on a collaborative basis, working with just two or three partner organizations in focused therapeutic areas that will do their early stage R&D. And it will be interesting to see uh, uh, how that plays out. Amazingly, the regulators uh, are playing their part. Uh, so, you know, you've got the FDA with their, their breakthrough therapy des designation, uh, the impact of the GAIN Act on, on antibacterials, stimulating uh, companies to get back into antibacterial research and development again. And they are starting to, to understand that, that more needs to be done from the regulatory side to encourage companies and make it easier for companies to get products to market. But there's still a huge amount to be done. This is a comment by Dale Edgar from Lilly uh, saying that we've got to move towards greater levels of collaboration and consortia taking programs forward. So in other words, essentially what he's saying is 
that Keynes is going to win. It's not going to be the free market. There has to be intervention. It has to be steered if it's going to be successful. Now, you know, in my view, the balance uh, is probably what's going to win out. You've got to have an element of uh, allowing companies to, to find their own level and see whether the fit ones are going to survive. But there's got to be a much greater supporting framework around about that that gives them the opportunity to do that. Um, I'll leave you with a couple of quotes from the great men themselves, uh, which maybe just say that everything that I've been talking about in terms of economics is bunkum. <laughs> Thank you very much.